Ever wondered what a brutally hard data science, data analytics interview question sounds like? Hey everyone, today we're going to go through three different kinds of data science interview questions, easy, medium, and hard levels of difficulty. And so if you're looking to see what questions are going to be asked from a company that you're interviewing at next week, check out Interview Query. We have a lot of easy, medium, hard, and very difficult questions that are asked by companies every single day that we update on a week by week basis. All right, let's start out with an easy question. Suppose you are a data scientist working on a marketing team for a B2P SaaS company, probably a lot of people. With the end of the fiscal quarter nearing, the company is missing 10% of its revenue to meet its quarterly goal. An executive asks the email marketing lead to initiate a huge email blast to your entire customer list, asking them to buy more of their products. Do you think this is a good idea or not? And why? If you don't know what B2B SaaS is, it is essentially think Salesforce, think Slack, think Notion. Think about these products that basically sell to other businesses to make them more productive. Generally, SaaS has a recurring revenue model. You pay for it monthly, and that's why it's really good because customers don't churn, especially if the business stays intact and uses it to become more productive over time. Probably the most boring business of all time, but the most lucrative, right? And most of you guys are probably going to work at SaaS companies. At face value, there's a reason why this is an easier question than most, because immediately when you hear this, you're probably thinking, yeah, it's probably not a good idea to basically send an email blast to all of our customers to get them to buy more of our products. And so for this kind of initial case study, the reason why it's easier is because we have a general idea of the solution. We just have to go through the nuances of why it might be a good idea or why it might be a bad. The question is fundamentally around how you think about data analytics as a decision-making mechanism and how you can provide data to support your own conclusions, especially when you're getting pressure from other people. So I do like this question because there's kind of two parts on it. There's the company communication and kind of workplace dynamic part of it where they're trying to figure out how you might interact with other team members, how you might push back against other departments. And then there's the aspect of how do you use data to back up your decision. Let's dive into this. So how do we know that an email blast is good? To increase revenue for a B2B SaaS company, we have to essentially get either more customers or make sure they don't churn. However, we know that running an email blast and sending it to all of our customers is likely going to first off increase the number of people that actually sign up for products, right? So if I think about our existing customer list, you know, some of them might have churned, some of them might have not churned, or some of them might want a promotion potentially. It's a good idea at face value because we know that it's going to increase revenue. But I think the further development is at what cost? Like what is the downside for sending out this email blast? The downside for sending out this email blast, we can list out probably outweigh the positives in this case, because the downsides would be that we're not segmenting our audience, so we are basically sending it to anyone who could potentially already have been buying from us or could potentially have unsubscribed or potentially could not be interested in this product but other products. We're also trading short-term revenue gains for long-term detraction, right? And so, for example, if we send out an email blast to everyone, we might get an incremental amount more revenue. But to me, this means that more people are likely to view our email as spam and potentially also unsubscribe for the future. Right. So we're not exactly providing them any value by saying, hey, please buy our product. Instead, we're kind of just gaining more visibility and mind share in their minds into our service offer. And because that might not be at the targeted moment that they need to buy, and it's only because we need to hit our revenue goals, then long term, it doesn't seem like a great way to do it. I presented the initial solution right, in this interview. And what generally needs to happen is we'll probably have to provide an alternative solution, right? Because the interviewer won't be satisfied by you just saying, no, it's not a good idea, or yes, it is, right? What we want to do is provide a better solution. So for me, a better solution here would be the fact that we could then segment our customers on the email list and figure out the ones that are most likely going to buy and send them the email instead to try to push them to first be able to buy so that we can meet our revenue. So for example, we could look at the data of all the people that basically viewed the pricing page, but then ended up not buying. If we segment by those customers only, they have a more high inclination to actually buy. And so if we send it only to those customers, we're likely to get higher open rates and more intent to actually purchase. Additionally, we can analyze our existing customer base and see which products are most likely purchased together. And so we could directly sell new products to the customers that have bought another similar product or one that is purchased commonly together with this existing product and then promote that. That is how I'd answer an easy, straightforward data science question, right? And so let's dive into a little bit of a harder question. 
All right, let's try problem number two. Let's say that you work at Uber. You're getting reports that riders are complaining about the Uber map showing wrong pickup location spots. How would you go about verifying how frequently this is happening? So why is this question hard? Why is this question hard? The reason why I love this question, and I would give this to any kind of junior data scientist or mid-level data scientist as well, is because it requires just more thoughtful thinking about the question. And I recommend everyone to first just, when you receive a question like this, just take a minute to pause and think through how you might answer this question. And in query, we use a four-step framework for how we answer these types of data science questions. First, we want to clarify the question. Second, we want to gather context, make assumptions as well. Three, we want to hypothesize on possible causes. And four, we want to validate our solution or basically validate our hypothesis with different scenarios. The biggest mistake that I see most data scientists doing initially when they answer questions like this is they have a four-step framework where they dive right in the solution. They go right to step number three. That's wrong. So for this one, we have some ambiguity in the question and a junior data scientist would basically say, oh, I would validate it immediately by looking at the you know, data and analyzing the distance between blah, 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 blah. That's wrong, right? The first thing we have to do is clarify is why do users think that the pickup location is a wrong spot, right? We need to clarify this question and make some assumptions. Our assumption is going to be the user interface that the writers use to actually figure out if it's the wrong pickup spot. Let's think about how a writer might actually do that on the writer app. So I assume that a writer would select a specific pickup spot, the app would then change the input by mistake or shows the second location correctly on the map. That could be one way that it's an incorrect location pickup spot. The second could be the app shows the writer pickup spot on the map and then the, shows the driver a different pickup spot as well. Those are just two ways that this could potentially happen, right? But if you jump right in and chose one of them, you wouldn't have clarified your thought process with the interviewer and they would assume that you dive right into problems without actually thinking them first. So for us, what we're going to say is we're going to then interpret the original issue as being the second one in which it shows basically the rider one spot and it shows the driver the other spot, right? We're not going to think about the UI issue of where the, like the location that might be bouncing around. We're going to make an assumption to the interviewer and we're going to say, hey, this is an issue that we're going to tackle. The second clarifying question we're going to make is the reasoning for why the driver might be showing up at a wrong pickup spot compared to where the rider is. For example, we need to clarify if it's not the fact that the actual pin location is wrong, but it's because the drivers just end up getting lost or potentially that they're actually going to a different spot on the map because it's maybe a safer area for them to actually pull over and pick up the rider. So in this case, we're distinguishing between what the app shows it's the wrong pickup location versus what's actually happening in real life in which the rider and the driver make this connect. In this case, the true positive of what we're trying to solve the issue is that the app shows the wrong location. But the false positive is that the app shows the right location for the drivers, but they just don't end up going all right, so after clarifying the problem, what we have to do now is determine exactly what our metric is gonna to be to figure out if we can identify this issue. The metric that we're gonna to use to figure out if this problem has actually happened is the total distance traveled by the rider from the driver's reported arrival until the rider gets into bar. We can say that if this value surpasses a threshold of one block, then that means that the pin location is the wrong location. And the reason why we're choosing this metric over other metrics is because we can't choose the Euclidean distance from the spot where the drivers arrive and the spot on which riders are waiting, because this doesn't consider cases where both locations are close, but requires a long walking distance. For example, if we're basically navigating around an obstacle or crossing a bridge, then that wouldn't work for that case. Additionally, we can't really choose the amount of time that the rider takes to get in the car as this information would be confused with riders just taking too long to basically see that the Uber arrived and specifically they could have not gotten the vacation or maybe they're partying and they don't notice it. We consider a good proxy metric because we're looking at the actual distance that the rider has to go. Now that we have this metric, we can consider a few different things. We can basically subset this data and one, to see how often and it's actually happening. Does this happen 10% of the time? Does this happen 1% of the time? Does this only happen in a specific city or a specific area? These are the kind of things that we have to segment to really debug what's happening. So this is where we are hypothesizing different scenarios after we get our metric that we can use to then subset the data. For example, 
So if the distance that has to be walked is sometimes 10 feet, sometimes it's 100 feet, sometimes it's like 1,000 feet and it's equal between all of that, then we can now isolate basically and know that if this is a normal distribution or a uniform distribution, we know that it's probably a random GPS bug. Furthermore, if it's a uniform distribution, then maybe we also know that the pinpoint thing has an idea of where it's going to be. It just keeps on getting it off by a little bit and sometimes a lot. The other approach is running the segmentation. So we segmented it based on actual distance of the data. Now we should be segmenting it on different factors, such as maybe city demographics. So yeah, specifically, is this happening only in one city and not happening in another city? Is this only happening at certain times of day? Which would be kind of a weird case scenario, but is this only happening when there's concerts and events where the GPS location is all weird because of signal frequency? This kind of analysis has to be done because we have to hypothesize kind of like high level first analyses for each of these. And the interviewer is going to be curious about which ones that we're presenting first as potential you know, issues for us then to kind of drive at solutions to discover if this is the case or not. So we figured out the issue was specifically the total distance. Now we're driving at solutions to figuring out the issue by hypothesizing that, oh, maybe it's a concert. Oh, maybe it's only happening in Seattle. Oh, maybe it's only happening along the specific coastline on the West Coast, but it doesn't happen in Oklahoma City. All these sorts of solutions. All right, the hard question, the ultimate question, right? Let's dive into it. A December 2020 survey has found that 38.2% of U.S. consumers have unknowingly shared misinformation or fake news on social media. It has gone so far that fake news got shared six times more than actual factual news reports. As a data scientist working on Facebook, Mark assigns you to figure out the percentage of fake news stories on the platform. How will you tackle this problem with a deadline of 24 hours? Boom. That's pretty hard. Facebook is a huge social media website, right? And the reason why this is a hard question, because not only do we have a big grandstanding kind of strategy level problem, but we're also given a time limit constraint, right? We don't have teams and a limited time to figure this out. We're just given a large kind of scenario and we have to dive specifically into how we might strategize this. We talked about the constraints. We talked about the fact that it's a big problem. We also have to define what fake news is. And we don't even have a definition for what fake news is, right? We understand that it's non-factual, but we don't even know how to figure out what's non-factual at this point. Like the problem before, first we have to figure out what our strategy is going to be. We're going to use the four-step framework again. But in this case, we're going to do more definitions of different metrics. Obviously, one, we have to clarify the scope of our analysis. A lot of junior candidates will try to tackle this thing in a very specific way or in too large of a way, and they don't actually tell the interviewer why they're doing that. For us, we're going to tell the interviewer, for example, we're only going to look at the US for this kind of fake news problem, and we're only going to look at, you know, specifically news feed posts. All right, we're going to ignore groups and all this other stuff. Is that okay in the interview? Next, we're going to figure out what we're going to define as fake news. Right. And so in defining fake news, we are constraining the problem yet again, right? which is key for these interviews because they can go on for so long or the interviewer could assume something that they want you to answer that you don't answer. So, for example, we're going to define fake news as spammers that are trying to make money off of fake content, Russian bots that are trying to tamper with elections, media outlets that are incorrect in the reporting potentially as well. And, you know, with this, essentially, we're not going to then look at reshares by basically users that are trying to you know, post about fake news. We're only going to look at the authoritative, like bad actors in this case, or unsuspecting bad actors from media outlets. Now that we've decide, defined these three things, how do we solve this classification of fake news problem, right? We can isolate each one independently, right? So for example, for spammers as bad actors, right? We can look at a bunch of different metrics. And this is something where you can now use your data science skills and experienced data science will actually understand how to specifically target something like spam, right? If you've worked on spam before, you know that specifically that we're not going to build like a super deep learning model to detect if something is true or fake and cross-reference it. Like that might be a solution, but instead in terms of the detection methods, we're going to use some heuristics, right? We're going to sample this ourselves and see like, are the spam articles being shared more often or less often, right? So if it's specifically spam, it's probably being shared less often. If it's media outlets reporting incorrect stuff, it's probably going to be shared more often, right? But the only way we can figure this out is to sample some data. So we can basically within 24 hours, grab some sample data, label 100 of it, and figure out what are the heuristics that are actually common for this. So let's talk about Russian bots then. Russian bots can be a little bit more challenging. 
Users may be less inclined to share articles after recognizing that it's fake, but it is more effective to focus on detecting the fake accounts run by a Russian boss rather than policing the content they actually post. We're going to go to the source and we're going to figure it out. And for that, to determine a fake account, we could define metrics such as the number of friends the account has, the average number of mutual friends with their friends, the number of user reports, the number of likes and replies on their posts if they're fake. By addressing the fake accounts directly, we can more effectively tackle the spread of fake news from the actual source. For media outlets that are incorrect in their reporting, right? We could see that potentially these posts are going to get way more views. But at the same time, we could build an unsupervised classifier to check comments mentioning terms like fake news, fake video, potentially also evaluate the validity and credibility of the American media outlets themselves. We could then also understand if newer pages with frequent reports indicate lack of a strong reputation. So if we're thinking about the New York Times, we're going to trust that the amount that they report is going to be less than the amount that some other brand of media channel is going to report. Obviously, there's some controversy there, and which is why this is a nuanced argument, right, in terms of Facebook. Lastly, our solution for this, right, is to then kind of create a potential model that basically checks the accuracy of this through different kinds of subsamples. And again, this is where it becomes a hard question, right? And the reason why I'm breezing through this is because I don't even know how I might solve this. This requires so much nuance, but it's crucial for you to be able to explain your nuance and explain your own expertise and strengths and gaps, right? My strength is in analytics first, which means that something like this, I'm not going to dive into like a deep learning model, a systemized approach, uh, a background with operations with fact checkers in the Philippines that escalated to people in the US, like all of that is going to be based on what kind of strength that you have when you're answering a question like this. And that's what the interviewer actually all right, if you guys think I did a horrible job on this, you know, let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to check out Interview Query. We have hundreds of these questions, tons of learning paths. We have the framework for you to learn in our product metrics learning path as well. Don't take it from me though. Check out what Muhammad and Daniel said about Interview Query, where they got jobs at credit expert as data analysts. Interview query felt like a perfect fit. It offered practical problems akin to job interviews and it was a valuable tool in aligning my skills with industry demand. And the platform's case studies and interview questions from actual companies like Walmart have been incredibly insightful, making me feel more connected to my career goals. That is what makes me really excited about building this product and producing videos for you guys. So if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you guys next time.